This morning we're returning to uh, Mark's Gospel, so if you'd like to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, <clears throat> we will take the next chunk of this passage, and that is verses 13 through 17. Okay, Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17, we see here the second attempt of the leaders to discredit Jesus in order to hand him over to the authorities in order to do away with him. This is what we read beginning in verse 13. And they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. So ends the reading of God's word. May he bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now you'll recall that um, the leaders of the temple were upset with Jesus. That would include the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people because of what Jesus did. I mean, he did, after all, cleanse the temple with his um, whip and so forth, although that may have been an earlier event. He may have cleansed the temple more than once. Certainly in, in this last case, he went in and threw over the tables of the money changers. He drove them all out of the temple, those who were merchandising, and he reminded them of the purpose of the temple. This would be a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, having said that and having denounced the leaders publicly, they are again incensed against Jesus, and they want to try to do away with him. Now, we've already seen a couple of opportunities in which they have tried to do this. The leaders came earlier, uh, asking him by what authority he did these things. Jesus said, I'll ask you a question. If you tell me, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it of God or of men? And of course, they weren't able to answer because either way they answered, they would get into trouble. So they said, we don't know. And Jesus said, well, I'm not going to tell you. Well, Jesus then secondly denounced them through that parable of the vineyard. Recall that uh, this owner of the vineyard planted the vineyard, rented it out to the vine growers, came to receive the, pr the proceeds at different seasons, and never received them because of the vine growers wanted to hold on to those things. They beat, it, they, they beat certain servants, killed others. Finally, he sends his son saying, I respect my son. But they say, this is the heir. Let's take him. Let's kill him. And then the vineyard will belong to us. And so they do. And Jesus says, what is God going to do to those vine growers? He's going to bring those wretches to a wretched end. He's going to take the vineyard away from them and give them to another group, to others, who will give him the proceeds at the proper time. And we saw from that, of course, that Jesus was saying the kingdom of heaven was going to be taken away from Israel. And as a matter of fact, he did take it away from them in 70 AD after he sent his apostles out to preach and to gather all the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then he brought judgment upon them. Now, God isn't done with Israel, of course, altogether. He's still bringing them into his kingdom through the gospel. But he has, in fact, given the vineyard to others those others are the church. Those others are believing Jews and Gentiles. Those others are us. And of course, we are to bring forth those fruits. We are to be busy doing the work that God has given to us in his kingdom. And we're going to see part of what that work is this morning. Of course, giving to everyone their due, giving to God what belongs to God and advancing the kingdom of heaven. But the leaders understood he spoke that parable against them. God's going to take the kingdom away from you, and he's going to give it to others. He's going to bring judgment on you. And so, again, they are incensed. And so they send another group to try to trap him in a statement, this time some Pharisees and some Herodians. 
in order to get him to say something that they could use against him, that they could charge him either before the people or before the Roman authorities in order ultimately to put him to death. So this morning we're going to look at that question. What is it that was behind the question? Why, I mean, what, what were they actually asking him to do? And of course, we'll look at the hypocrisy behind that particular question. And we're also going to see what Jesus meant by his explanation, by his answer. So first of all, what was behind the question? And the, the first thing that, that would pop out to us if we understood who these people were was the, the two groups that actually come to Jesus, these Pharisees and Herodians. If you knew something about these two groups, one thing that would strike you is the fact that these two people, these two groups, really had nothing to do with each other because they hated each other. But in this case, they closed ranks in order to attack Jesus because they had a common enemy. Now, what was the gripe that these groups had against each other? Well, the Pharisees were those who hated Roman rulership. They were willing to tolerate that authority and they were willing to submit to a certain degree to the Romans in order to hold on to their affluence, to their authority. But they are the ones who would later pro uh, prosecute the war of the Jews against Rome. These were the ones that actually uh, started the war that eventually brought 70 AD in the destruction of the temple. The Pharisees hated the Romans. But on the other hand, the, the Herodians were staunch supporters of the Herods, who were, of course, uh, uh, you might say deputies of the, uh, of the Caesars and had their authority from Rome. They were the ones who were Roman authority present in uh, Jerusalem, in, in Palestine, in order to keep the order. Herodians supported them and they supported the payment of taxes to the Herods and to Caesar. But as I've said, even though they hated each other, they came together to attack Jesus. It's interesting how a common enemy can sometimes cause even enemies to join ranks in order to fight against them. I mean, for example, Sometimes the church actually will close ranks with people that they would never worship with and they would never serve God with because these other people, these cults, for instance, they say that they're Christians, but we know they're not because they deny the true God and they deny the true way of salvation. But yet if we have a common enemy, such as abortion or some other moral evil that we both stand against, we might be willing to close ranks to fight that enemy, at least that particular enemy will do that much. Well, we see the same thing taking place here. The Pharisees and the Herodians closing ranks because they both wanted to do away with Jesus. So what is it that they actually say to him? What's the question? Well, they begin, notice, first of all, with a statement that perhaps could be understood as flattery I mean, they, they say, teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. What they're actually doing here, of course, is setting him up, or at least they're trying to do that. Because Jesus, we know that whatever we ask you, you're truthful. You're going to have to tell the truth. And you don't defer to anyone, which means it doesn't matter who asks you for the truth. You're still going to say it regardless of what might happen if you do it. They were doing this again further to bait the trap for him so that he would be required to answer their question, a question they knew that either way he answered, he would get into trouble. So what is the question? Teacher, we know that you were true. Well, we've already said that. Okay. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Now, the question really has to do with a tax that uh, the Roman government levied on the head of every household. Again, the Pharisees hated this tax. They didn't want to pay tribute to Caesar. The people hated this tax. They hated being in subjection to the Roman government. But the Herodians supported this tax. Now, what if Jesus were to say no? 
Well, the Herodians would immediately go to Herod and they would accuse Jesus of teaching the people not to pay their taxes, of teaching rebellion, insubordination. And so they would come and arrest him. But what if he said, yes, it's, it's right to pay this tax? Well, then the Pharisees would immediately go to the people and they would say, is this your Messiah, the one who has come to break the rope of the, yeoman, the, the Roman oppressor? He's telling you that you need to submit and pay your taxes. And so he would, they would turn the people against Jesus Christ. So you see, either way, Jesus would get into trouble just as with the first question regarding the baptism, well, regarding by what authority he did the things that he did in the temple. Now, you do need to realize we know, even though they don't understand, that the one they're attacking is the one who has infinite knowledge and wisdom. You cannot trap him in a statement. Jesus, of course, immediately saw their hypocrisy. I mean, after all, you have these two groups closing ranks to come against him, talking about something they both disagree on. Obviously, they were up to something. And Jesus did what they said he would do. He spoke the truth. Now, even though it would be threatening to do this, again, he's not a respecter of persons. He was willing to speak the truth. By the way, there's a lesson here for us too as we follow the example of Jesus Christ. Do you need to speak the truth? And do you need to speak the truth regardless of who asks you of the truth, even if it could potentially get you into trouble? You see, there are situations where you know that to speak what is right could bring persecution, could actually end up, you could end up getting hurt. And there's always that temptation either to cover the truth or to lie about it or to downplay it so that people don't attack you. But the Lord tells us we need to fear God rather than man. And we need to speak the truth regardless of what will happen, remembering that what's going to happen is sovereignly in God's hands. I mean, God may actually will that we don't get injured for it, that nothing happens like that, or he may will that we do, but either way, our responsibility is the same. And knowing that God will not allow anything to happen to us outside of his will, we should be willing to speak the truth regardless of what might feasibly happen to us. And so Jesus does that now. First of all, he asks the question, why are you testing me? And then in another parallel passage, he, he goes a little bit further. He says this, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? You see, Jesus was not um, afraid to speak the truth to a group of people who could potentially injure him. I mean, how is this with regard to winning friends and influencing people? A uh, very you know, famous book that was written a number of years ago that basically tells you how to butter people up. Jesus was not into buttering people up. He was into speaking the truth. So Jesus, first of all, says, why are you testing me, hypocrites? Bring me, then, he says, a denarius to look at. And they were willing to do that because so far they still thought Jesus is going to fall into our hands. Whichever way he answers this question, we're going to be able to condemn him. And so they brought him one of the coins used to pay the tax. And then Jesus asked this question, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Well, of course, that would be the case in those days, uh, not unlike our country today. Whenever you had a change of the ruler, you would always have a change of currency. All the coins would be melted down and reminted with the, the image of the person who happened to be the ruler at that time to remind you who was the ruler and to, to, to who it is that you owe taxes to and even more than that, who actually owned that money. See, because you didn't actually own that money, Caesar owned that money. He's just letting you use it, you know, in order for commerce to go on and so forth and trade. Sounds kind of familiar today, doesn't it? Because that's actually the way our country works. And there's, real, there's really a big question mark as to who actually owns the legal tender that's in your pocket. Do you own it or does Caesar own it? Does the government own it? Well, in this case, there was no question. The money belonged to Caesar. So Jesus said then, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's 
and to God the things that are God's. Since the money belongs to Caesar, give it to him. But more importantly, he says, give God what belongs to him. Now, that was his response to the question, the question that was meant to trap him, but he avoided the trap. If the money belonged to Caesar, how could you not give it to Caesar? And they were amazed at his answer, and they left. Now, Jesus, again, in his infinite wisdom, avoided the trap of the enemy, but what's more important for us this morning is what did Jesus actually mean by what he said, because as you know, He's dealing with a subject that is very near and dear to our hearts, and that is the question of taxation and what we actually owe to the government. Now, first of all, Jesus certainly meant to say that they should pay their taxes, give to Caesar the thing that belongs to Caesar. Now, Jesus didn't comment on how much we are to pay, but that we should pay them. Now, it's this is a difficult saying, especially for us, because our government is doing many things that we don't necessarily agree with. And when you're not happy with a particular government or with any authority, what a particular authority does, it's always difficult to submit to that government, especially in paying the taxes that are required for this work to go on. And particularly when, more particularly I should say, when the money is spent questionably or even sinfully. But Jesus says that we must pay taxes. And not only taxes, but we are to give to the government everything that we owe them. When he says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he wasn't talking just about the currency. He was talking about also the honor and the submission that we are to give to them. Think about what Paul said in Romans chapter 13 and who it was he was referring to when he says that you need to submit to the governing authorities. He wasn't talking about the authorities in Israel, although there were government, I mean, there were Roman authorities there, but he was talking to the Roman government in general. He says we should submit to it because all authority is established by God. It's there because that is what God has willed. Now, thankfully, the Lord doesn't put us in a situation where there, we're going to have sort of a conflict of interests because we know that earthly governments, as I mentioned earlier, can try to require us to accept or to do things that are clearly contrary to his will. God does not tell us to submit to the government when they tell us to do things that are sinful. There is a limit on every authority that God has established. There is a certain sphere of authority, there is a certain area of authority, and when they go outside of that area and they're transgressing in the sense that they're, they're calling us to do something that God calls us not to do or not to do something that God calls us to do, then we have to obey God rather than men. But when they are within the bounds of their authority, when they are in fact enforcing what is good and telling you to do what is good, when they are punishing evil and telling you not to do these things that are evil, and we have to admit that even in our, in our government, there's still a lot of things they want us to do that are good and a lot of things they tell us not to do that are evil. We need to listen to that. When they protect life and liberty and, and perhaps put limitations on us to protect our lives, then we do need to submit to those things. And also, since this government and authority is established by God for the purpose of creating an environment of order so that society can exist, since they are doing God's will, since they are his servants and they devote themselves to this work, we are to support them through our taxes. Now again, we don't like to, to talk about taxes. I think we all admit that we do need to pay taxes. The thing that we may disagree on is how much. And I don't want to disappoint you this morning, but I'm not going to spend time trying to tell you how much that should be to try to establish the biblical boundaries of taxation. I do believe that there are boundaries, but only to point out that Jesus does, in fact, command the payment of taxes. And let me just put a couple of things on the end of this particular subject. 
We are responsible to pay our taxes, but as we've also already seen, they are responsible for how they use those taxes. Now, we are going to be held accountable for submitting to that commandment of God that we pay, but they are going to have to answer for the way that they use those taxes. They will give an account to God. And I believe that every sinful thing that any leader of this nation or any nation does, they will stand before Jesus Christ on the day of judgment, and they will have to give an answer for it. And everything that they do that is evil, that they have not repented of, if they haven't trusted in Jesus, every single one of those sins is going to weigh them down into hell forever. Nobody gets away with anything, you see. The fear of the Lord is meant to turn us away from evil. And perhaps if our government understood something more about God's will, perhaps they would be a little bit more afraid of the way they do some of their spending. So again, God is going to hold everyone accountable. But here's the second thing I want to say. If we want the government to do things the way that we believe they should do them, the way that God actually says we, they should do them, and if we want them to impose upon us that which is clearly biblical with regard to taxation, the only way it's going to come about is not through grumbling, complaining, and throwing rocks and so forth and, and calling the government by a bunch of names. That isn't going to change anything. The only way it's going to change is if the kingdom of heaven advances. You know how we've been looking on Wednesday evenings at a whole, well, over the past several years, a variety of things as far as you know, what to do with the environment and what to do about this, this issue and that issue. What is the solution to all of these problems? What is the solution to all the sins that our society is involved in? What is the solution to all the things that our government is doing that, that, are, that are sinful, that are wrong, and downright wicked? The only solution to any of these problems is the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. The only way it advances is by evangelism by telling other people about Jesus Christ, of their need of faith and repentance, and by praying and fasting and seeking that God would advance the kingdom of heaven. If you really want to see government change, that's the way it's going to change. That's the only way it's going to change, unless you can, of course, bring about some kind of greater physical influence against them, but we, we can't do that. It's not going to work, and, and of course, as Christians, we can't do that anyway. We've got to do it the way that God calls us to do it. Unless, of course, extreme measures, but we don't, we don't want to necessarily uh, work with that this morning. What God has given to us, of course, is simply this, that we evangelize. That is our first and foremost responsibility. So we don't need to talk about civil uprising. We don't need to talk about trying to take over the government and so forth. What we need to do is do what the Lord has actually called us to do in the first place, which is to be witnesses. Witnesses of the truth, we need to evangelize. So if we're unhappy with the way things are, which I believe we all are, we need to do what the Lord has called us to do. And in the meantime, be content with his will. Just submit to what the government calls us to do. And as far as it doesn't you know, cause us to break God's commandments and labor to move the kingdom of heaven forward. So render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but at the same time, let's make sure that we give to God the things that belong to him. Now that's the second point I want us to look at under this application. What does this mean? What the Lord is, is telling us ultimately is that we need to obey God. We need to give God the things that belong to him. That's something the Pharisees and the Herodians were not doing. They were resisting God. They were working against God. They were trying to trap Jesus and kill him. Obviously, they were not giving to God the things that belong to him. So we must not only honor the magistrate by paying our taxes, we need to honor God by paying what we owe him. Now, what is it that the Pharisees and the Herodians owed God? And what is it that we owe God? Well, we've already seen a couple of those things. We need to give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. We need to seek to advance the kingdom of heaven. After all, that is a commission the Lord has given to his church. But we owe him many more things. 
that we can actually spend the rest of our lives unpacking because the Bible expresses those. But let me just summarize them for you. You owe God your love. You are to love him with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. Think about what Thomas Watson said. How excited we get about the things of the world and how drowsy and kind of dull we get when we talk about the things of the Lord. We need to give God our hearts. We need to love him most of all. That is what you and I owe him. You owe him your faith and trust. The Lord says you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from your sins. If you haven't done that, that's what you owe him. You need to believe his word and embrace his Savior. You owe him obedience to all of his will. Again, what we've seen, you need to, you, well, you need to pick up your cross. You owe him your life to give yourself as living sacrifices. Your whole life is to be a continual act of worship to God. You are to love him and at the same time hate his enemies, hate the world, hate the flesh, hate the devil. And I don't mean by that hating the people of the world because we're supposed to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But we are to hate the world and everything the world stands for. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. Those things God hates, those things destroy people. We are to hate those things as well. We are to live as Christians. That's what we owe God. Uh, you've, you've heard that expression. It's been around for a number of years. I think it's kind of losing momentum by this time. But what would Jesus do? To be a Christian means that you are like Christ. You are like little Christ, which means that you would do what Jesus would do if he were in your situation. What do you owe God? What do I owe God? Well, what we owe him is to do what he would do, what Jesus would do, if he happened to be in our shoes in that particular situation. That's what we should always be asking ourselves. Jesus always did the things that were pleasing to his Father, and that is it. His meat and drink was to do the will of God. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be doing what Jesus would do. What we know is honoring to the Lord in every decision, in every circumstance, in everything we do. Give to God the things that belong to God. Now let's not forget that in honoring God, we also have to give to others what God says we ought to be giving to them. If we are to give God what belongs to God, if we are to give him obedience and everything, we also need to give him or give others the things that he requires we give to them. To the magistrate, we've already seen submission, taxation. Children, you need to give love and submission to your parents. Parents, you need to love and instruct your children. Raise them in the ways of the Lord. Wives, you are to respect and love your husbands. Husbands, you are to love and cherish your wives. Members of the church, you are to submit to your elders as they bring you the word of God. Elders, you are to care for the flock and lead them in the ways of the Lord. Paul, uh, Peter tells us we are to love the brotherhood as brothers and sisters. We are to love one another and fellowship and minister our gifts to one another. And then we are to honor all men, love our neighbors, we love ourselves. Seek to bring the lost to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the bottom line, as far as what Jesus is telling us here, is simply this, that yes, you are to honor the government. Submit to lawful authority, to the lawful exercise of authority. And yes, pay taxes because God has ordained them, established them, and they devote themselves to this very thing. But you are also to honor God by giving him the things that belong to him. Again, Peter sums it up, which is why this is our memory verse for this week. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. This is the reason why the Lord saved you. This is the reason why he freed you from your bondage to sin, was that you might do this. Peter writes, act as free men. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil but use it as bond slaves of God. Now, you're only going to be able to do this, what the Lord calls you to do in anything, in a way that is honoring to him, 
You can only do it with his help. You can't do it in your own strength. This is not a roadmap to how you make it to heaven on your own. This is something you really can't do unless you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. And the only way you can have the Spirit of God dwelling in you is if you have trusted Jesus Christ. So if you haven't done that, that is where you need to begin. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins and then begin to follow him. He will give you the strength to do this. All of this can be summarized again in, in the second thing Jesus says, give to God the things that are God's. If you do that, then you will be obedient in every area and give to everyone what is due them. Well, may the Lord give us the strength to do this. Some of the sayings of Christ are difficult. They are hard, especially, again, at this particular juncture in history and the particular condition of our nation. It is difficult to hear these kinds of things. But rest assured that if we do what the Lord calls us to do, if we submit where we can, if we pay our taxes where we can and so forth, and as we are called to do that, if we honor the Lord, he will take care of us. He will. And if we especially honor him in getting the gospel out, we will, by his grace and in his time, see things change. And that's really, I think, what we would all like to see. So may the Lord help us to do what we need to do in order that God may do what it is that he desires to do in our lives and in the life of this nation. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to give us the grace to do that.